lord, before I was saved by my lord the master of roles, I was going to ask, answer, I should say, I was going to answer my lord, lord Justice Warby's question um, about paragraph 100 of uh, Mr Justice Saini's judgment of the penultimate sentence. Uh, do, doing the best we can, we, we think what Mr Justice Saini was saying there was that, uh, that Mr Corbyn's, as we would say, comment uh, that the police wanted to throw Mr Millett out of the meeting at the House of Commons, that that comment was suggesting um, criminal misconduct on the part of Mr Millett. We, th we think that's what the learned judge had in mind there, but it, it's, it's not entirely clear. I, I hope that's an answer to yes, my sir. Lord's question. Uh, uh, and before I go back to what I was dealing with, I, I've been asked by my learned junior to make clear, in case I didn't make clear earlier in answer to my Lord, Lord Justice Warby's question about the Section 3.2, Section 3.3 question, uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby put to me whether it was enough to look at the explanatory note to the Act. Uh, and I just want to make clear our position is it's not enough just to look at the explanatory note. We would invite the Court to look carefully at uh, our skeleton argument where we've set out the legislative history uh, at paragraphs 24 to 29, which we say makes clear uh, the propositions that I sought to outline to the court. Yes, well, don't, um, just to say, Eric, I have looked at that. I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, my lord. So, my lords, my lady, I was, I was dealing with my first, uh, first of my five sub-grounds in relation to my second ground of appeal as to why uh, the, the judge erred in, in concluding this was defamatory at common law. And the first point is this, we say, very significant error the judge, the learned judge made in finding, which was central to his decision on defamatory tendency, that there was criminal misconduct. And we say that simply cannot stand in the light of the learned judge's finding on meaning, where there is no suggestion of criminal misconduct at all. Uh, and as we've already made the point, it does seem to us that even in circumstances where it is said the police want to throw someone out of a meeting, uh, that, that does not, we say, suggest criminal misconduct. And it's important to remember that in this context, this was not a public meeting. This was a meeting which was taking place, as was clear to viewers, in the House of Commons. And the police were no doubt there to facilitate the... Um, effective running, a uh, smooth running of, of, of such meetings. And again, as I said earlier, that it's also important to remember that viewers would have appreciated that Mr. Corbyn said that he, he said they should, uh, Mr. Millett should not, and, and the other person should not be removed from the meeting. So for the learned judge to then import, we say with, without any uh, warning and debate or argument, this, a suggestion of criminal misconduct. Uh, fatally undermines his conclusion that uh, the statement complained of in the meaning that he found uh, would give rise to a uh, defamatory tendency. So we say on that on that basis alone, uh, the judge's decision was wrong, and it is appropriate we submit for this court to consider uh, the matter afresh. Uh, there are, as the court is aware, four other subgrounds on which we rely, um, all of which we say the judge got wrong, uh, and again, which uh, reach uh, arrive at the same position that this court should consider the matter afresh. Uh, our second subground is that uh, in in holding, as he does at paragraph one hundred. <laughs> Um, that there was a, that Mr. Millet had been accused of being abuse of abusive behaviour in relation to a public speaker on a controversial topic, and this and that was an accusation of a type of conduct which is contrary to the values of modern democracy, where freedom of speech is a cher cherished value. Again, we say indicates an error in the judge's approach to the statement complained of and the, the meaning that he found. And 
that's for the, this reason, as we, we set out in the skeleton argument, that the only point at which um, Mr. Millet is being, is, was accused of being abusive towards a public speaker named Mr. Hassassian was after he had finished his speech. So it is made clear by Mr. Corbyn that during Mr. Hassassian's uh, powerful and effective and passionate speech, Mr. Millet sat quietly uh, and noted what was said. But it was only after the speech, so there was no interference uh, with Mr. Hassassian whilst he was speaking. There was no interference with him during that. It was only after he had spoken that Mr. Millet uh, spoke to Mr. Hassassian, and at that point was really, really strong on him, uh, or very, very, and or very, very abusive. Uh, and we say on that basis, there was the reasonable viewer would appreciate that it was not being suggested by Mr. Corbyn that Mr. Millet had in some way interfered with the um, with the right to freedom of speech of Mr. Assassia. Uh, the reasonable viewer would appreciate simply that uh, Mr. Millet, it was being said that Mr. Millet had approached the speaker afterwards, someone that might be considered to be a political opponent or somebody on the, uh, the opposite end of the political spectrum on this issue, and had engaged him in debate after he had sat silently and quietly listening to his speech. And there'd been a, a, a heated exchange during which he'd been really, really strong on him. But that is that would not be understood by a viewer as to be an interference with Mr. Hassassian's freedom of speech. Quite the opposite. Well, it's never difficult because you make a point quite rightly that um, it's an interference with Mr. Corbyn's freedom of speech to make him go to trial on these issues, and that's supported by a number of authorities that um, proceedings. Even having proceeding to talk to Mr. Millet, yes, for something he said that he interfered with his freedom of speech. So, um, and we know that um, it's a contempt of court to impose sanctions on someone after the event for something they've said in court. Yes. Um, so, is, is this a point of principle or of point of duty? Well, my lord, the, the the point I make is that this is this is different from the examples my Lord puts to me. Because what is being said here, a reasonable viewer would understand what Mr. Corbyn was saying, that this is an example of freedom of speech. This is an example of debate. It, it's, it's not the same as being injunctive from saying something, right? even having uh, defamation proceedings brought against them. It is an example of listening to what a speaker says, but then engaging with that speaker in, in the way that is a, an aspect or a part of freedom of expression. It, it, there was no, there's no suggestion in the, in the statement complained of, nor in the meaning, that Mr. Millet's conduct was preventing Mr. Hassassian from speaking or expressing his views in the way that he saw fit. Quite the opposite. It's just simply saying that Mr. Millet clearly disagreed with him and engaged him in, in a, either in a debate or expressed his own views about, about this issue in clearly in forceful terms towards uh, Mr. Hassassian. But a reasonable viewer would not consider that to be an interference by, an allegation of an interference by Mr. Millet with the right to freedom of expression being exercised by Mr. Hassassian. And, and it seems to us that even the, the references to being disruptive in the earlier, at the earlier meetings, even those do not, um, would, would not lead a reasonable viewer to conclude that Mr. Millet was interfering with someone's freedom of speech. But if anything, that gets closer to that concept. But it isn't that which the judge is referring to at this point. The judge is clearly referring at this point to the suggestion that Mr. Miller, that Mr. Millet was abusive and really, really strong on Mr. Hassassian after he'd given the speech um, in 2013. 
So we, we say it's, it's the judge made a serious error there, and the, the, the effect of that is he reached a conclusion that a reasonable reviewer would think this was um, or the meaning had a defamatory tendency because uh, a reasonable viewer would take a view or an attitude towards Mr. Millet, uh, which um, substantially adversely affected their view of him. And we say that that is plainly wrong because a reasonable viewer wouldn't. And this is clearly one of those areas where the uh, not only the threshold requirement isn't met, but the consensus requirement isn't met. Now you draw a distinction between being very, very abusive after someone has spoken to when they are, are actually speaking. I mean, the judge just said was being accused of abusive behaviour in relation to a public speaker on a controversial topic. Yes. This is an accusation of a type of conduct which is contrary to the values of a modern democracy where freedom of speech is a cherished value. My, my lady, yes, but the, the reference to abusive can only be a reference to the, the conduct yes. which took place after the speech. And so you're he was being abusive because Mr. Corbyn had exercised his, well not Mr. Corbyn, but the speaker had exercised his right to um, to speak on, on this topic. Yeah, I, I do seek to draw a distinction between abusing a speaker whilst they are speaking in an attempt to prevent them from speaking and an attempt to prevent them, I shouldn't say attempt, I don't, I don't want to import <coughs> issues of intention, but with the effect of preventing a speaker speaking and expressing their views and exercising their right to freedom of expression. I, draw, I seek to draw a distinction between that and sitting quietly during someone's speech and then after their speech going up to them and, and debating with them in heated terms, being really, really strong on them, or even re very, very abusive towards them about their speech. Now, the, the, I, I submit there is a very real distinction between those two situations, but also there is a very real distinction between whether or not that amounts to, and if it does, the extent to which that amounts to, an interference with somebody's right to freedom of expression. And even more important, how a reasonable viewer would would consider that and whether a reasonable viewer would in those circumstances think sufficiently less, if I can paraphrase the test, sufficient think sufficiently less of in, in that in that situation, uh, Mr. Millet. Uh, and, and we submit that it simply doesn't meet that threshold requirement, nor does it where one has a controversial topic such as this meet the consensus requirement because some people will think it, it is wrong to be abusive towards a speaker after they have spoken regardless of the topic some people will think that um, in certain circumstances it is perfectly permissible perfectly appropriate to berate, which was the word used in 2013, to berate a speaker after they've spoken if they are expressing views or advocating a position that the listeners disagree with and disagree with strongly. Does it uh, make a difference how the viewer would perceive Mr Corbyn's attitude to this? Because this is part of his explanation of why he said what he said. Yes. He's not down Is a relevant point, and it, it could impact on it could impact on a viewer uh, and how a viewer perceives it. We submit that in this situation, it, do, it, it, it doesn't, because there is there is still a sufficient divergence of opinion um, 
for a reasonable viewer to, to be left thinking, well, I, I, to, to not think less, and if I may use that shorthand. Get convoluted. <laughs> um, to not think less of Mr. Miller. A, a viewer would not, we contend, a viewer would not watch that program and think, oh my goodness. That Mr. Millet has behaved appallingly. It is absolutely outrageous what he did to that Mr. Hassassian. You know, I would, I will never speak to him again. Or, or however, one wants to characterise it, a viewer wouldn't be left with that. We submit a viewer would be left with this is a highly sensitive, controversial topic. Mr. Corbyn is being challenged in very strong terms. That he, he is. Uh, what he's, he is anti-Semitic and that what he was saying in 2013 is anti-Semitic. Mr Corbyn is putting forward, as, as my Lord Lord Justice Corbyn says, his explanation for why he said what he said. And the viewer would be left with, in, in the position of thinking, well, at, at worst, I don't really know who's right or who's in the wrong here. I can't really think worse of anyone. The reader is not asked, or the viewer is not asked to make a decision about that. It's what Mr. Corbyn was conveying by what he said that we're focusing on for present purposes, not the end result of what the reader thinks, having looked at the evidence and made his or, his or her own mind up, whether a defamatory imputation was being conveyed. My lady, yes, I, I accept that. And, that, that and that's what we're looking at. Yes, and and and, my, and our submission is on the on the meaning determined by Mr. Justice saying. A, view, a viewer would be left on, on that meaning, on the statement of Lenovo on that meaning, a viewer would be left with the position thinking, well, he, Mr. Millet may well have been justified, or it may have been appropriate, or perfectly appropriate, or fine for Mr. Millet to go and confront Mr. Hassassian on this controversial and sensitive topic after he had given a powerful, passionate, and effective speech on the history of Palestine and the rights of the Palestinian people. And they and some viewers, perhaps depending on their political views or their view of the world or their own perspective, some people might think less of Mr. Millet. Some people might think what Mr. Millet did was perfectly appropriate. But the, 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 the point we submit is, not only does it not meet the threshold requirement, but it does not meet the consensus requirement. It is, it is not, we submit, a matter of consensus in society that one must not confront a speaker after they have spoken, a speaker with whom one disagrees strongly. It is not a mass matter of consensus that one should not confront them and be really, really strong on them or very, very abusive. Some, some people will think that is inappropriate behaviour. Some people will think that is very bad manners. Some people in the 21st century, in the way we deal with protest, in the way we deal with uh, debate on controversial topics, some people might think it is perfectly appropriate and it's the right thing to do, depending on the circumstances. But but it's not really um, a requirement that every, everyone in society has to think the same thing. No. No. It's a consensus which isn't a universal view. So the mere fact that some people might think differently doesn't really make a point. Well, you've got to, to, to say that they're, they're, it's just not a shared view. Well, my lord, that, that, is, a, that is our submission. That it, it isn't a shared view. That to behave in that way to a speaker with whom one strongly, not that it really matters, but with whom one strongly disagrees on a, a difficult and important and a controversial and sensitive topic, it is not a shared view of society that in those circumstances one must not or should not uh, approach that speaker afterwards and be really, really strong on him or, or very, very abusive towards him. Of course, there are other... I mean, for my, for my part, Mr. Uh, Hudson, I, g I get um, really, really strong, but I still have difficulty with abuse. But, my lord, yes, and it will it will in part depend on 
this does very much depend on the surrounding circumstances. And and I take my lord's point that um, Mr. Corbyn was was telling this story to explain himself in relation to a different situation. Yes. So he wasn't naturally wanting to play down. So the viewer would know that. Yes. When looking at it. Yes. But then there might be lots of you. There might be some viewers, lots of viewers, who disagreed with Mr. Corbyn, who were not supporters of Mr. Corbyn, who were doubtful about his explanation. There may be some who were who who took at face value what he said and, and, and therefore thought, well, what Mr. Corbyn's saying must be right, and I I, I think Mr. Millet shouldn't have done that. Or, but the, our submission is, even with words like very, very abusive, because, because they, this slightly aligns with my point earlier about opinion and comment, because we submit they are opinion, and that has to be taken into account in, in this question, which, of course, it wasn't by the learned judge because he'd found it was a statement of fact. Um, but a, view, a viewer will be less inclined, it seems to us, to think worse of Mr. Millet when he's being described as very, very abusive, when, when it is unclear what is actually being alleged. But also because, for, for example, they, they're not going to think it was the sort of behaviour which I suggested this morning to my lord about punching on the nose, and my lord, if I may respectfully say so rightly, said, well, we're just not in that territory. Of course we're not in that. With respect to green, we're not in that territory. So, a viewer is going to think, well, he's not saying he did something like that. He's he's saying he was abusive, but that's in the context of saying in 2013 he berated him, and berating means to chide or scold or a variant of that. To, and to say he was really, really strong on him, then he raises it to very, very abusive. I mean, what do you say? And I know this is another of your points. I think it is. I mean, do you, do you say that the reasonable viewer uh, looking at the uh, whole thing would think that Mr. Corbyn was really saying he was uh, very abusive in the political context of putting his own point of view and that because of that political context, it, it, it's not a defamatory, it's not really... It's not contrary to shared values because yes. different people have different views. Well, yes, precisely. I mean that you say that, but it's a sort of hard. It's a hard thing to express well, when you're using the kind of language that was used. Well, my lord, yes, and I, with respect, I agree. But if one watches this, ref, this reflects, I'd say, the importance of watching the program, not reading the transcript. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I, I've, I've inevitably fallen into the trap. I've read the transcript so many times and done everything that one's not supposed to do in terms of lawyerly analysis of it. And we dissect it and pass it, and all of those things we shouldn't do. If, if one simply watches the programme, the full 24 minutes through once, a viewer does not come away thinking <clears throat> that Mr. Corbyn is saying Mr. Millet did something really, really bad. To, to Mr. Hassassin. It's just not of that level. I mean, you could just one, one looking at Mr. Corbyn. What did he, what, 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 I mean, just put in your own words. I mean, this may be trespassing on the meaning point, but put in your own words what you say, the reasonable viewer uh, seeing the programme once through yes. thinks that Mr. Corbyn is saying about Mr. Millet. Well, I, I, I go back to the word berated, my lord, because that's, that's the word that struck me when I first watched it. It's berated, although that's the 2013 yeah. program, uh, the 2013 speech. The reasonable viewer would be most unlikely to distinguish between the three occasions, or actually multiple occasions, that Mr. Corbyn is actually talking about when you read the transcript. Yes, it's, it's it, one, one alliance berated, really, really strong on him, very, very abusive. Yes. One alliance those, they're all, they all mean the same thing, we submit, from a reasonable viewer's point of view. I mean, let, let me tell you what I think you're saying, because I think you're saying those add up to expressing 
a contrary political opinion with great force and 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 perhaps even even possibly with with bad language uh, but nonetheless expressing a political opinion with great force that's the sense in which you say abusive is to be taken my lord yes and I, that's the point at which i should sit down really and that's the, that's your case yes and and what one looks at if one looks at the program looks at the demeanor of mr corbett looks at the way he expresses this it, it, it it's it's just we're just in that territory a viewer would not think uh, um mr corbyn is saying anything more than that and also it's it's important to remember what does mr corbyn say he does about it we defend him he, in 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 the um he says, well, I had to, I, I felt I, he was quite upset about it. And that, that's important. What, what was Mr. Hassassian's reaction? Mr. Hassassian's, Hassassian's reaction, according to Mr. Corbyn, was quite upset. Those are the words in the, in the statement complained of, not, not the, 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 the learned judge reached a different view on, on meaning. But those are the words that the viewer would hear. Quite upset by it. Mr. Corbyn took the view um, that he he should say something uh, uh, and mr mr corbyn says he was upset by it so i i felt i felt i should uh, sorry my lady yes uh, this is at uh, page 67 of the electronic bundle um, the core bundle of the core bundle my lord it's, it, this is in taking it from mr justice saini's judgment so it's, yeah, yeah. it's the foot of page 67 in response to the question about anti-Semitism. Um, very abusive. And I was upset on his behalf from what he'd, he'd spoken, obviously, at the meeting, but also the way he was treated by them at the end of it. And so I felt I sh should say something in, something in his support, and I did. And that's it. And so, of, of course... My lady, the president's right. Mr. Corbyn was upset by it, he says, and a viewer would, would take that. But Mr. what was Mr. Cor Corbyn's reaction? To say something in support of Mr. Hassassian. That, that's as far as it goes. It's not calling security. It's not trying to get Mr. Millet banned from a meeting. It's not. But he was also upset by the way he was treated by the people. There's, well, there's two upsets. I think this is a slight confusion. I mean, the, the first upset is that that uh, the, the ambassador was really, was quite upset by them being really really strong on him. Yes. And the second upset is Mr. Corbyn was upset on his behalf. Um, from from what he, which I, I think really means from what he'd spoken obviously at the meeting, in other words, from what happened at the meeting, but also the way he was treated by them at the end. Yeah, I, my lord, I, I read the bit where he said he'd obviously he'd spoken obviously at the meeting. I read that as a reference to Mr. Hassassia. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And I mean, I think the point is that um, well, uh, I mean, it, it's quite a simple point. But you say this is all a political cut and thrust, and um, they say uh, no, very very abusive is 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 defamatory. Well, yes. And we, we just say A, it doesn't meet the threshold, and B, it doesn't meet the consensus requirement. Because B, an you're ordinary. You're still only on your third point, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my Lord, I, I won't. Um, I'll go straight to my third point then. Um, the, 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 again, the, these, are, these are relatively short points, and I, I obviously emphasise my, my first and second point. Uh, the, but I will do. I will deal with these briefly. They're, they're dealt with in some detail in the skeleton argument. But uh, the, th the third point is: uh, it, it seems to us it's clear from um, <coughs> paragraph 102 of Mr. Justice Saini's judgment that when deciding the, this question of defamatory tendency, he takes into account. The, uh, and, and as part of that, he has to decide the, um, threat, the substantive issues of threshold requirement and the consensus, uh, threshold of seriousness and the consensus requirement. 
but the learned judge also clearly or at least appears to take into account factors which are not relevant to, to this issue. <coughs> Because this is, this is the gap in paragraph 2.4. My lord, my lord it is, yes. And, um, and we, we say he, took the, he just took the wrong approach because he took into account the issues that are strictly relevant to uh, an, a, a submission. Uh, if, if one was making a Jamil submission, that, that it would be relevant to that. And it's relevant to the procedural threshold for bringing a libel claim rather than the substantive threshold, which we say that's all this, the judge ought to have been concerned with at that stage. And I'm a bit puzzled by it. Um, the two authorities. So is it two point four or twenty two point four? It's two point four. It's a type two point four in yeah. the judgment. Yes, two point four. Um, so this is page um, thirty eight. So I haven't read. I haven't read two point four. Can we? Can we look at it? Um, where is it in the authorities? Page four hundred and ninety. So tab um, twenty four. I'm grateful. Tab twenty two. I just made a point that I was um, trying to recall. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there are two authorities, I think, cited for this proposition, um, which is the top half of paragraph 2.4, or at least the, the, the paragraph 2.4 that one of the players were looking at. One is um, Canish and Hume, and the other is my lady. Having looked at Camish, um, what we've got in paragraph 2.4 is all that was said. Yes. That's it. It's not explained in any way. It's just said to be a multi-factorial question. Uh, and having looked in the past at Hadji Ioane, that's a Jamil case. So it looked to me as if, you know, at least arguably, Gaffey was wrong about it. Yeah. Yes, well, we, we it, if I may say so, we share that view. I, I, our, our position is a straightforward one that in deciding in deciding this question it, it is one, one simply looks at the statement the, the statement complained of and the meaning more, most important the meaning and the question is is, is the meaning in the, in, as found by the judge does that meet the substantive threshold uh, sorry the seriousness threshold and the consensus requirement based based on that and uh, and the the, the judge did more than that. That was clear from paragraph 102 of the judgment. The judge, I, I, I think, at the invitation of the claimants, considered the multifactorial issues, which we say are not relevant to this question. So, my well, we, well, lords, my lady, we say the, the judge erred in doing that, um, and therefore his, it's another reason why his decision was wrong, and another reason why we invite. What the about the footnote? I'm sorry to interrupt. <coughs> Uh, what about the footnote of 44? Sometimes I look at Hadji or Arne. The allegation in the case is a particularly serious one, and we've heard publications made by Oxford Business Center, Financial Times Journal, publications. That, that, being published in the newspaper. That, that appears to be in the context of a, a, an application on, under the Jamil principle to strike out as an abusive process, rather than a determination of whether yes, or not... But, but the issue is, one of the issues in, on striking out is triviality, isn't it? Uh, yes, but that's a set... That, we, that, we I mean, submit at that stage, that, what, that, that is one of the issues, is triviality, or was. Or, or, yes, on striking out an abuse, and that is what, that's the procedural threshold uh, which is uh, which which is one of the ways in which freedom of speech is protected mm. but that is separate and distinct from the substantive threshold in determining meaning so one one can have a meaning which has a defamatory tendency so it meets the would meet the seriousness threshold and the consensus requirement but nonetheless, was an abusive process by reason of triviality because it had only been published to one man and his dog, or or, or the other, it's, the game's not worth the candle for whatever reason. But that that wouldn't be because it wasn't 
defamatory. Whereas what, what was going on in our case, in front of Mr. Justice Henry, we, we weren't advancing a, a Jamil issue. We were simply saying that it didn't meet the seriousness threshold, nor the consensus requirement. I'm sorry, my no, no, or, or the consensus requirement for it to be to have a defamatory tendency at common law. But context can be relevant to whether something is defamatory or not. Yeah, yes, the, the context can Including be. Including yeah. if a, if a well-known professor of medicine makes an allegation in the DMJ in relation to a doctor, say, uh, which is addressed to a professional audience, that's part of what can factor into the seriousness of the allegation. Whereas if somebody, a passing, a passing homeless person made a, a, a similar allegation to a, nobody in particular, it might not be regarded with that level of seriousness by the, by the doctor to, about whom it was made. My lady, yes, I, I can see how that might fit into the question of whether the substantive threshold had been passed, but but that is probably is still a separate question from the, the Jamil question. I mean, the, the, these series of cases were, were, were what led to the um, decision of Mr. Justice Tugendhat in in Thornton. Yes. Because he was looking at the issue of seriousness and, and, and um, whether whether there was a threshold before the court would engage or the legal process should be engaged in that context yes. of these series of cases. Yes, I, I agree. But it, it's, um, I mean, if, if one looks at Thorne, if, if I can invite the court to perhaps briefly look at Thorne, my lady's mentioned it, it seems to us it's dealt with. I think it's paragraph um, tw 20. Is it in the bundle? It's, yes, it's in the authority's bundle. It's tab, it's tab four. And the, the, the paragraph I had in mind is at page 65 of the bundle, page 1991 of the report, paragraph 20. Little Roman numeral I, the threshold of seriousness. Hypothetical reasonable reader must not be unduly sensitive. So there must be a threshold of seriousness. Um, and that threshold must be interpreted consistently with Article 10 of the Convention. And then Justice Tudenhout sets out, sorry, that sets out the uh, quote from Lord Atkin in Simmons Stretch. And then, then in further, in further detail, the threshold of seriousness is dealt with at paragraphs 51 and 52 at page 76 of the bundle. But that, that we submit that all of the all of that discussion by Mr. Justice Tugendhat in Thornton is focused on the impact of the statement of statement complained of. The, the, these are not the uh, the Jamil questions. Although he goes on at ninety two and ninety five to look at the question in in relation to Jamil. Anyway, here it is. Yes. An interesting point, but may not be the most significant one. No, it's, it's, it's not the most. But we, we do we make the submission that the, the judge took into account irrelevant factors in deciding that the defamatory tendency was met. Mm. Then our, our fourth point is that the judge failed to incorporate the seriousness threshold when he went on to consider whether or not um, the meaning uh, 
met the requirement of being contrary to shared values, and he relied in particular on my Lord Lord Justice Warby's decision in Monroe in Hopkins. And the, the learned judge at 96 um, appears to reject the notion of immoral behaviour at page 83 of the core bundle. And, and, apply, and the test that the learned judge then applies, having considered Munro and Hopkins, but rejecting the notion of immoral behaviour, despite the fact that that is referred to in Munro and Hopkins by my Lord Lord Justice Warby, and we say is an important part of, of the matters to be considered, the learned judge then at 99 and 100 appears to apply, apply a test where the, the question is simply whether it's contrary to the common or shared values of our society and modern community and seems to reach the conclusion that provided that test is met, that's enough. Uh, and we say that's not right because even if that test is met, one still has to go on to consider whether or not the seriousness threshold is met. And we say the judge didn't do that for the reasons I've already have already explained. And then our, our final point it is, uh, as we set out in the skeleton argument, that at 100, the, the judge, and we've touched on this, I've touched on this already to an extent, the, the judge rather ironically relies on the asserted we don't accept allegation that there was an interference with freedom of expression as a basis for interfering with Mr. Corbyn's right to freedom of expression. Uh, um, and we say, for many of the reasons I've already given to the court, we say that just, that just simply is not a proper basis for the judge to reach the conclusion that there was a uh, the, the statement complained of in the meaning found by the judge had a defamatory tendency because as I've already said viewers would fully appreciate that this was a, an exercise by Mr Millett by Mr Hassassian by Mr Corbyn also by Mr Marr of their respective rights to freedom of expression uh, and it's perfectly appropriate for someone to, um, to, to, to say that someone, as I argued earlier, someone has behaved, uh, has berated a speaker or behaved abusively towards him, without that meaning that that person has interfered in an impermissible way with that speaker's right to freedom of expression. And it does, it seems from paragraph 100 that that is the, the thing that particularly influenced the judge in deciding that the meaning that he found uh, would lead a viewer to conclude that Mr Corbyn was suggesting that Mr Millett had behaved in a way that was contrary to the common and shared uh, values of society. So, my lords, my lady, we say both individually and cumulatively, all of those uh, five points uh, lead to the conclusion that the decision of the judge on this important issue um, was wrong. Uh, and we submit that this, this court, if we're right about that, we would invite this court to consider the matter afresh rather than remitting this um, uh, back to the judge or to another judge to deal with. Uh, and I've essentially made my submissions as to why we, why we say, and I'm, it may be better if I deal with these further in reply, why we say if, if the court does deal with this matter afresh, it, it clearly, the statement complained of in the meaning found by the judge, this clearly does not meet A, the threshold of seriousness, and B, the consensus requirement.
I assist the court any further. Thank you very much, Mr. Hudson. Yes. My lord, my lady. One thing the uh, appeal benefits from is that there are very few documents which I need to take the court to. Principally, those documents concern the transcript of the programme, the meaning found by Mr Justice Saini, and Mr Justice Saini's judgment itself. If I can first turn to what this appeal is all about, and that is the words complained of. Now, of course, I accept that this is a matter of impression. And what is most important, as it was with Mr Justice Saini when he gave this judgment, is you all have uh, watched the programme, the crucial 24 minutes. But of course, this judgment is being picked apart, so I do need to refer to the transcript to make my points good, rather than just referring, asking you to re refer to your memory of the programme. The judgment, where it quotes the words complained of, doesn't quite begin at the beginning. Therefore, can I ask you to turn to the supplementary bundle, bundle at page 7? And you should see about two-thirds of the way down, um, which when the old-fashioned parlance would be by the second punch hole, a question by AM, that's Andrew Marr. Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn, are you an anti-Semite? And to be fair to Mr. Corby, and I should put his answer, which says, no, absolutely not. I've spent my whole life opposing racism in any form, and I will die fighting racism in any form. Now, for reasons I'll, I'll make clear shortly, the issue of anti-Semitism, the issue of the Palestinian-Israeli dispute, any of those political issues, isn't directly relevant on this case insofar as it's got in considering meaning and opinion and whether the allegations are defamatory or not. And that's because if, having introduced this topic, I could then ask you to turn to page nine of the same bundle. And we've stayed with the topic of anti-Semitism before we got here. It's at this point that Mr. Ma, as, um, if, you, if you like, the dramatic produ production of the evidence, and he plays this recording of what was said in a speech given by, or a talk given by Mr. Corbyn in 2013. Now, if I may just read out some of these ext extracts to make my point. The other evening, we had a meeting in Parliament in which Manuel, that's the man styled as the Palestinian ambassador, made an incredible, powerful, and passionate, and effective speech about the history of Palestine, the rights of the Palestinian people. This was dutifully recorded by the thankfully silent, silent Zionists who were in the audience on that occasion, and then came up and berated him afterwards for what he'd said. They clearly have two problems. One is they don't want to study history, and secondly, having lived in this country for a very long time, and probably all their lives, they don't understand English irony either. Now, the next question by Mr. Marr is important. A strange thing to say. Putting yourselves in the shoe of the reasonable viewer of that program, Mr. Marr is clearly asking Mr. Corbyn about his comments on the people he refers to as the Zionists, not understanding English history or English <coughs> irony. Now, Mr. Hudson says that in reply to this question or this statement by Mr. Marr, a strange thing to say. That Mr. Corbyn begins to explain himself, to offer an explanation. But of course, crucially, what Mr. Corbyn does is not continue a political discussion about whether he or the Labour Party is anti Semitic or not. He mounts an ad hominem attack against Mr. Millet. And he does so not by talking about anti Semitism, but by digressing and attacking the man by making what we say are factual allegations <coughs> concerning Mr. Millet <coughs> and his behavior at various meetings which have discussed the Palestinian issue. Now, the words have been gone through many times would be familiar to you. But the words I would focus on are, first of all, you've got incredibly disruptive. It says, indeed, the police wanted, wanted to meet it. 
matter if Mr Corbyn says that he didn't want them thrown out or not. Mr Corbyn isn't saying, all oh, the police got it wrong, they weren't being disruptive. The fact is that the level of disruption has reached a point at which the police want to eject the two people, one of whom is Mr Millett, from the building. Now, returning to the factual theme, Mr Corbyn sticks the knife in further, if we put it this way, by saying this isn't just a one-off. He goes on to say they've been disruptive at a number of meetings. And again, we say in context, it's a matter of impression. That's clearly a factual allegation. They've been disruptive at those meetings. Now, at the later meeting, when Manuel spoke, they were quiet. But they came up really, really strong on him afterwards. Now, my Lord, the Master of the Rolls says, well, that of itself perhaps could, could be opinion. But of course, the key thing in analysing statements like this is context. And when you have a series of factual allegations, the viewer isn't going to be looking to pick out which bits are opinion and which bits are fact. Momentum builds up. And we say in context, that really, really strong statement is in fact a statement of fact. And what did they do to him? The proof is in the pudding, or the proof is in the result. On the one hand, they acted in such a way as to cause the police to want to throw them out of the meeting. But also, they caused Mr. Hassassian to be upset by their behavior. Now, that suggests some concrete element to what they, how, and why they were being very, very strong, really, really strong, pardon me. And again, the proof is in the actions that Mr. Corbyn wants to leap to Mr. Hassassian's defense. Uh, they're moving down the page where it reports uh, JC said they were very, very abusive to Manuel. We say, if you like, that's a classic example of a bare comment. If someone says someone's very, very abusive, and then repeats very abusive, the reader's bound to conclude that actions have taken place, actions have been committed by Mr. Millet, which have caused Mr. Corbyn and the police to come to the conclusions that they came to. And again, the proof is in the result. <coughs> Mr. Corbyn, as my lady the president pointed out, was also upset on behalf of Mr. Hassassian, uh, reporting he'd sp obviously spoken at the meeting, but the way he was treated by them at the end. And so it felt, again, this comes back to Mr. Corbyn's need to spring to Mr. Hassassian's defense. He wanted to say something in his support. Now, that First of all, Mr. Hudson says that's, that's a political allegation in a political context. It's a political program. Mr. Marr introduced a political discussion, a discussion that was then and still now uh, exercising the nation, the existence of anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. What you clearly have here is a discrete factual allegation made by Mr. Corbyn, which doesn't respond, doesn't explain why he said they didn't understand English irony. It instead attacks them. And we say, in context, and it's a matter of impression. I, I know I've gone through it word by word, but, but I'm not going to go through it any in any greater detail. That would strike the reasonable reader as a factual attack upon Mr. Millet. And indeed, that's the way it struck Mr. Justice Saini. Now, the case put to this court, and I have to say to Mr. Justice Saini, is thus. Actually, submissions on the, these types of issues should be short, because I think the longer the submissions, the less likely one is to be right about the meaning. It ought to be fairly straightforward. Look at it. That's what it says. It's a series of, of factual allegations. If it's not a series of factual allegations, then it's a description of what happened. Now, a description is something, again, which it falls into the bare comment rule. If someone describes something, someone summarizes someone's bad behavior, they behave so badly the police wanted to throw them out, then clearly the implication is that factual misdemeanors have been committed. Now lastly, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to paragraph 88 of the judgment, because clearly that's crucial when considering Mr. Justice Saini's reasoning. But Mr. Justice Saini does say, we say in the alternative, 
our, our counterpart of 88, that the bare opinion principle stands. And in his judgment, looking at this program in context, what happens is that if this is opinion, which is how his second sentence of paragraph 88 begins, then it's obviously bare opinion. Now, we say he was perfectly entitled to reach that conclusion. Um, there's no absolute rule that when one sees bare opinion, that therefore that is in fact equivalent to a statement of fact, because the law is one must always look in, into things as co in context. And really, this is a, a rule or a tip or a hint for interpretation, saying that the court should be aware of the fact that when someone makes a bare assertion of opinion, that often carries with it the implication of facts underpinning it. Um, for instance, Mr. Hudson alluded to the example given by Lord Phillips in the case of Joseph, where he referred to what consider the situation where a barrister is called a disgrace to his profession. Now, that can be interpreted as opinion, of course, context is everything. That's clearly going to make the reader or the viewer think, well, a disgrace to his profession. He's clearly being accused of acting contrary to the values of his profession. Um, and I'll come to Lord Phillips's consideration of that in the context of Section 3.3 of the Defamation Act shortly. But what I'd like to start with is what we say is, is very much a, um, a, false, a false argument advanced by the defendant, uh, which goes back to the genesis of Section 3 of the Defamation Act of 2013. Now, the section three you'll find at page 454 of the authorities bundle. Uh, that's tab 22 of the physical bundle. And you'll see it quite simply says section three, two, the first condition is the statement complained of was a statement of opinion. We would say that's just maintaining an obvious rule, that for an opinion to defense to run, the statement complained of must itself be an opinion. And the factors that come into play there are factors of interpreting the words complained of. And there are clearly settled law on that. It's just a question of interpretation. And if it becomes relevant, the principle or the hint or the rule that the court ought to bear in mind the impact of a bare comment suggesting a f an underpinning fact ought to be borne in mind. Well, what section 3.3 does is wholly different. Section 3 says the second condition is that the same complaint of indicated, whether in general or specific terms, the basis of the opinion. Now, we would characterize section 3.3 as introducing an element of fairness into the honest opinion defense. And that really goes back to what Lord Phillips said in, in the case of Joseph. And you started off by saying that there was a false argument about the genesis of 3.3. What, what, what is the false argument? Well, that, sorry, there's a, there's, there's a false argument that the existence of section 3.3 somehow precludes the court from considering the bare opinion principle at section 3.2. We're saying section 3.2 and 3.2 are actually separate things. <coughs> yeah, so, so your and submission is that the existence of 3.3 does not prevent the court considering fair opinion at the 3.2 stage. Yes, they're, they're separate stages. Now, in Joseph, uh, paragraph 5, which you've already been taken to, uh, Lord Phillips alludes to the, to the bare opinion principle. And 
effectively says it's, it's settled law. And that must be right because it's been applied in Kemsley and Foote and so on and so forth. What Joseph Spiller did was suggest the law as to whether the relevant facts ought to be set out in the words complained of needed to be adjusted and made, if I can put it this blunt way, a bit more defendant friendly or a bit more friendly to Article 10 of the Convention protecting the freedom of expression. So looking at Section 3.3, it says the second condition is that the statement complained of indicated whether in general or specific terms the basis of the opinion. Now this we say is the fairness test. And this is what Lord Phillips meant when he was talking about the barrister being a disgrace to his profession. If the speaker is making that, offering that opinion based on the fact that the, and it's rather a parochial example, but it's one given by Lord Phillips. If uh, the speaker is making that, giving that opinion based on the grobby and dirty bands that the barrister appears in court uh, when he attends court, then that ought to be made clear because otherwise there would be unfairness because people might assume that the professional integrity of the barrister was being questioned. In fact, perhaps that the barrister didn't read his brief properly before attending court. So we said that that's, that's wholly different. These are two stages. And for Mr. Hudson to argue that by the imposition of Section 3.3, that somehow the bare opinion principle was abolished at common law is obviously wrong. If Parliament if Parliament had intended that to be the result, Parliament would have abolished the bare opinion rule. But the fact is the Parliament kept at Section 3.2 the crucial, the obvious criteria that for an honest opinion defence to run, the statement in question must be one of the one of opinion. Now, dealing with briefly with the issue of political speech, which I've dealt with in my skeleton argument, there can be no special rules when it comes to whether something. So can, can I just ask you this, um, Mr. Bennett? How do you get to Section three two, to Section three three in the case of a bare opinion? Well, you might not get there. No, you never get there. Well, I, because I, if you because if you have a bare opinion, that is a fact, and you're out on the first condition. So why do you need three three? Be, 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 I'd say one thing in libel, when interpreting words and looking at different publications, is, is never say never. And I've been at pains to say that the context is everything, and there will be circumstances which we can't foresee today where context would bring up a scenario. But what you've also got to remember is that looking at Joseph and Spiller itself or taking the case of, of, of Kemsley and Foote, that was a case where an opinion was expressed about facts which were not set out in the words complained of. possible to express an opinion about something that is notorious without the particular fact as to why the thing is notorious being set out in the words complained of. Lower than Kemsley. Yes, th yes. That's um, the headline. Yes, that, it was a general criticism of the newspapers owned by Lord Kemsley, who was a, um, a Robert Maxwell, Rupert Murdoch figure of his day. And there was a general scandal, criticism of his newspapers. And as my, my lady, the president, said, there was a headline saying, lower than Kemsley. There was, if I'm right in my recollection, there's nothing in the article saying, in this edition of his newspaper, he lied about this, in this edition, he lied about that. 
because it was such a notorious controversy, the ordinary reasonable reader reading that newspaper was deemed to know, to know about the facts or the subject matter. So they're really, it's tempting again with defamation to try and. and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't think you're quite addressing the point I'm asking you. About. Oh, um, the, the words of section 3.3 3 are that the second condition is that the statement are complained of. So that's the words complained of indicated. This has nothing to do with context. The well, words whether complained of indicated whether in general or specific terms the basis of the opinion. So to get through three, you've got to have a basis in the words complained of. Is that right? Yes, and a basis includes something. It can be quite vague, as in love. No, I, I, I get all that, but, it, but it, it's got to be in the words complained of. Something. Something which ties it in to the, to the yes. notorious facts. So, so my, my question is simply, <clears throat> if every time you've got a bare opinion case, the bare opinion is a fact? I, I'm not putting the bare opinion principle that high. Um, because it's... It's tempting to look for hard and fast rules, but context is everything. I would use the word highly likely that a bare opinion would be interpreted to carry factual imputations. So is it your case that it's a principle of law or something else? Section 3.3. Three. No, no, the bare opinion rule, whatever, well, it's, whatever label we're calling it. It's, it's a point about bare opinion. It's... it's well, you use the word a hint or tip. Didn't yeah. you? Yes, it's, it it's there, for it's, instance. It's, 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 there are a number of indicia yes. that may, you know, it's, you, don't, you don't, you don't, an allegation of fact doesn't become a comment because it's preceded by the words, in my opinion. No. However, the use of the words, in my opinion, might be relevant. Yes, right. Depending on the context. And, and there are a variety of rules. Uh, which, I say rules, rule stroke guidance, uh, lots of assumptions made about the reasonable reader, um, whether that's a matter of law or not, or just a, a, a matter of common sense is indeterminate. Uh, but they're certainly expressed as uh, principles of law. Well, it seems to vary according to cases. I mean, the yes. way that it's put by the judge in this case um, doesn't expressly identify it as a principle of law. Yes, I, you could always say that there are assumptions about how a reasonable person would read or view something. So when, when one looks at it that way, um, again, it's difficult to see how an Act of Parliament could even abolish such a rule, whether implicitly or explicitly, because it's just a way... It's just a common sense approach to these issues. Now, I, I, I quoted a uh, case to similar effect, which I, I shan't take you to, it's not in the bundle, where a similar principle is actually applied in contract law in certain circumstances. And again, that's not just trying to show off that we've done lots of legal research. I just, just smile, be... Mr. Bennett, because I really don't think anything similar is, any, is, is to be found in contract. Oh, well, well it's, 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 it's this, <laughs> amazingly, this, what some outsiders might see an arcane aspect of defamation law, is also reflected in, in contract law. When you're buying something from someone and you know they know all the facts about the product they're selling, if they offer their opinion, it's a great product. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing terribly then you are assuming that they're making protestations about the quality of that product. That'd be it. It's not... Price, I'll save my life on. Exactly. So this isn't just um, an arcane matter of, of defamation law. It's defamation law trying to get to grips with how the reasonable person watching the Andrew Marr programme, what conclusions 
conclusions they, they would have reached. So I, it, it, as my Lord, Lord Justice Warby points out, sometimes it's a point of law, sometimes it's this is how the reasonable reader uh, interprets things. We say it's, that's, that's an interesting point for writing the judgment. But when one looks at the outcome of this appeal, the outcome of Mr Justice Sainer's decision, it doesn't really matter either way. The point is the judge putting himself in the shoes of the ordinary viewer. Now, in terms of, of political speech, I've briefly outlined some facts on that. And we say this is an ad hominem attack upon Mr. Millet. This isn't a considered discussion of the anti-Semitism issue. And we say one can't point to any particular rule of interpretation, say, oh, because that was said by the leader of the opposition, therefore that's interpreted as opinion. Now, the fact he's the leader of the opposition and what he says and the circumstances in which he says it are the appropriate context. But there's no get out of jail card, get out of jail free card, because one occupies a particular position in the political realm. Now, in regard to Article 10, Thornton itself was introduced, and I, I shan't take you to this unless necessary. It's in my skeleton argument. Uh, Thornton itself was introduced in order to enact a safeguard for uh, defendants' Article 10 rights. And if one wants to get into defending political speech, that is something where there are, there are other protections. In the no, just say that problem. again. Thornton itself was? It's, it introduced the threshold. the threshold of seriousness. The threshold of seriousness. I'll give you the reference. It's paragraph 96 of Thornton. Paragraph 96. Yes. In order to protect the Article 10 right of a defendant. What page is that? That is at page 83 of the electronic bundle. I think it's really paragraph 95, isn't it? Oh, probably. Maybe he gives the reasons for it. Um, he, he introduces the word substantial. Yes. Yeah. 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 That modification is necessary. It is not already there in the Yes. Well, in fact, at the top of the page, the page. Is that the, the common law already contains a threshold of seriousness of that kind, but if he's wrong about that, it's necessary for it to be there. Yes. For whatever reason it happens to be there, it does protect Article 10. And that's made clear at the top of the page. Well, actually, no, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just stay with paragraphs 95 and 96. Um, and then there are, there are other hurdles for a claimant to get past. The claimant has to satisfy Section 1 of the Defamation Act and establish there was serious harm to his reputation. And if the defendant, Mr Corbyn, wants to plead, plead a public interest defence, which relies on his freedom to talk about these issues, saying it's in the public interest, then there's a defence under Section 4 of the Defamation Act. So really what we are saying is this isn't an arena, this isn't an appeal where public policy needs to be at the forefront of the court's reasoning, or any part of the court's reasoning, because this is about looking at words, interpreting what they mean, and being satisfied they pass the threshold of seriousness, therefore satisfying um, really giving proper protection to the Article 10 right. So you say public important. policy in Article 10 is not relevant at this stage of the inquiry? It's, re it's built into the protection, because Article 10 is built in to the, to the threshold seriousness test. Threshold. Seriousness threshold. And I'll also say the honest opinion defence Yeah. was clearly passed by Parliament in 2013. And if you don't mind me making a, a broad assertion, 
uh, given that the Human Rights Act had been in, in 1998 and legislation has to comply with it, uh, the Honest Opinion Defence, as set out in the Act, must be convention compliant. Uh, it, it's accepted by the respondent that the court looks to the whole of the publication complained of to decide whether it's opinion or fact or a mixture. And we say in conclusion, having gone through the words complained of, that Mr Justice Saini clearly wasn't plainly wrong to reach the conclusion that it was in fact opinion. And that the argument... If it was in oh, fact fact. <laughs> fact, pardon me. It's uh, not, not a Freudian slip. And I just want to go to paragraph 88 of the judgment, uh, which you, you may know off by heart already, but I will go there. <clears throat> well, actually, can I just start, forgive me, to be fair to Mr. Justice, saying paragraph 1, one of the judgment, electronic... Core bundle, page 66. Paragraph 1. Paragraph 1. That's a long we'll way Start at the beginning. <laughs> OK. Um, you see, page six, electronic, page 66, the core bundle. And he says, this is a claim for defamation arising out of a statement. Quotes the statement made by the defendant. Now, in context, that must mean the whole of the programme complained of. He's not saying that... It refers to picked out parts. Well, he's so saying that, during an interview. Well, the English isn't, it isn't wholly clear. It's a statement during the interview. Yes. Well, I mean, what's what, the point? Said, what is said of paragraph five? The relevant parts of the speech and the statement made on the Andrew Marshall set out below. Yes. And he starts, he doesn't start quite as early as I did with the question, are you anti-Semitic? But he sets out the crux, and certainly it's the crux as agreed by the defendant as to what was said, and certainly as agreed by the claimant. And he's, he's rightly identified the words complained of. Yes. Yes, he's not trying... Yes. No. He's not, not no. Um, and you, you'll see why, I, in fairness, I pointed out the definition of statement at the beginning there. In my judgment, it's clear Mr Corbyn was making factual allegations in the statement as to Mr Millett's behaviour on more than one occasion. Now, he's not talking about the meaning that Mr Justice Saini found. He's talking about the words complained of the words that were spoken. Therefore, we say he's followed the correct methodology in concluding that this is... And really, what comes afterwards, a sentence is saying, effectively, if I'm wrong, and the submission is correct that he was expressing an opinion, then actually it's a bare opinion. And I find that carried the implication. I find that, in effect... That was the same as making factual allegations. And, and what do you say about the question I asked um, Mr. Hudson uh, concerning the sort of level of um, uh, level of opinion you need to yes, have? Yes, it's it's theoretically one. It would be open to the court to go through the meaning found by Mr. Justice Saini sometimes happen in those parts which the court says constitute opinion. But stepping back from that for the initial part of the process, when one's carrying out the impressionistic exercise, if a statement is overwhelmingly making allegations of fact, it's more and more unlikely that the reader or the viewer will pick apart bits and say, oh, that's an opinion. 
whereas 90% or the other 910 allegations are factual. Uh, but I have to accept it is open to they court. Could. They, cu they could. They could. So, it's, so the one, in, 1 to 10, the 10 statements yes. point, 10 sentences point, you, you agree with Mr. Hudson that in theory you could have nine statements of fact which could be defamatory followed by a, a tenth sentence that was pure opinion. Yes. Um, right? Uh, that's yes. possible. Now let's focus on the tenth sentence. As I asked Mr. Hudson, what if it's um, if it, if it's an expression which could be um, opinion and could be fact, depending on the context? And Mr. Hudson's answer to me there was, "Well, what you do is the court stands back. It's a difficult decision for the court, but it's a question as to what the overall impression of the court is, as to what the reasonable viewer would think it was." Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes, it, it's that same test. Yeah, same test. And um, it, the, the statute is, could have been worded better. Um, let me get my copy. Uh, section 3 2. The first condition is the statement complained of was a statement of opinion. Uh, what, but we what would page interpret. Page the electronic? Oh, pardon me. Page 454 of the electronic authorities. So, so the first condition is that the statement complained of was a statement of opinion. And we, it, it's a bit of a stretch, but we interpret that to mean not exclusive. It doesn't have to be exclusively a statement of opinion. Well, otherwise it would be very restrictive of the um, freedom of expression. Indeed. And the defense, emasculate the defence. Yes, uh, particularly because you can have ten... Ten allegations. The ten is the most serious, and actually, is is an opinion of itself. Um, if you, if if the other nine also had to be opinion, the defence would be shut out. No. So so if it's a bit of opinion, then you can theoretically get away with it as being an opinion, being all opinion. Yes. Um, it's then open to you. I mean, if it's a mixed statement, which sometimes happens, where defamatory allegations of fact and um, there are opinions which are defamatory too, then it can be defended on both justified and um, yes, yes. And of course, it's it's from the opinion. defendant's point of view. It doesn't necessarily help them for one part of the statement to be opinion if there are five other defamatory factual allegations, if indeed the opinion um, is, well, it's, if I put it this way, it, it, it's complicated, but, but turning to your central premise, it is possible to pick one out of ten, and you, you'd have to work on Mr. Justice Saini's meaning, mm. and well, say that particular part is, is an opinion. Well, I mean, you don't, do you? You have to work on the statement complained of. Well, that's... That raises the single issue, single meaning issue, which I've dealt with in my skeleton argument. In, in, a, in my further skeleton argument, essentially. Um, means that whenever the court is dealing with cases such as this, defamation cases, one's got to look at the central meaning of the, the article or the publication complained of. Uh, for instance, in, defama in defamation where there's a truth defense, that's crucial because it's that meaning which a defendant has to prove is substantially true. I mean, and I must say I'm left wondering the value of salami slicing these cases into preliminary issues. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure that's highly yes. controversial. I mean, everybody's in the court apart from me is absolutely certain this is the best way of dealing with it. But um, th this is a sort of 
hugely overall impressionistic attitude of, of you know thing and why, why is it commonly is this the common course i see it done in some of the cases that um, it, it's almost um i would say it happens in 90 percent or more cases and the idea is that once the first bit is determined it, it goes off and surfaces. yes i mean for instance if you take this this claim if the if there was no trial of preliminary issue and the defendant just pleaded an honest opinion defence, uh, one would have to wait for a trial a year later following disclosure, exchange of witness statements. I'd be open to the judge in the first few paragraphs of the judgment to say, this defence fails because this is not an opinion. Uh, therefore, best to get to that stage sooner rather than later to save everyone the expense. Right, so, so the honest opinion here is the critical bit. I suppose the two points before us, you say, are the critical bits. Yes, it's the, the honest opinion is the building block. If, if it's not an opinion, the opinion is the building block. If it's not an opinion, the defence can go nowhere. So best, best for a, a bit of tough love where a defendant has pleaded an opinion, which in fact the court says isn't an opinion. Yeah. Okay. So I've, I've set out in the well, skeleton argument the broad all reasons under, underpinning why the single meaning issue is so important. Because otherwise you've got an amorphous math, mass of words. There needs to be some discipline so the court knows what it's dealing with. What's interesting is one looks at section 3 itself. And if I could turn you, my lord, to page 454 of the electronic bundle. And one condition we haven't looked at is the third condition, which you'll find at subparagraph 4 of section 3. And it says the third condition is that an honest person could have held the opinion on the basis of any fact which existed at the time, and so on and so forth. So that's why it's important to pin down what the opinion is. And you'll see the same in subparagraph 5, where it says the defence is defeated if the claimant shows the defendant did not hold the opinion. So whilst Mr Justice Saney did and was correct to look at the statement as a whole to decide whether it was an opinion or not, because again, context is everything, what he then has to do is distill the meaning. I mean, I'm and sorry to be so difficult, Mr, Mr. Bennett, but... I just find that the idea that a 20-minute a interview with certain parts of it picked out and underlined can be either a, either a fact or an opinion, um, obviously it's me. So, I mean, Mr. Justice Saney says, well, this is, these are facts, the bits that are underlined. Um, but... What, what if they were opinions? Well, they're plainly not all opinions. I mean, some of them are obviously facts, you know, that Mr. Millet was at a meeting and that, that so on, and that he, he um, spoke to Mr. Hassassain and so on. I mean, all those are facts. So, and you're, you're now telling me, well, you've got to look at the whole thing, but what is the whole thing um, well, for this purpose? Is it the bits underlined? Is it the, the meaning that he's established? the judge has established, or is it just the bits that are alleged to be um, opinions by way of defence, so that it knocks out enough of the statement complained of to no longer be even arguably defamatory? The rule is that you've got, got to conclude what the reasonable reader, would, reasonable viewer, I should say, would have watched. And I think it's reasonable in these circumstances to assume the reasonable reader would have watched the whole program. Now, we're not asking you to watch the whole program. Well, no, I, I think, think that's it's common, common ground, ground. That, yeah. that you only need to look at look yeah. at a slice of it. Um, and to return to the phrase salami slicing, it's and how the reasonable reader behaves, it's it's to look at the whole thing. Mm. The reasonable reader is getting a general impression. Is this factual if it's opinion? I would say if they in fact nine facts that's going to be pushing the reader into the overall, reaching the overall impression. 
But Mr. Bennett, I'm not sure that what you're saying can be right on the words of the statute. It may be, but what the statute talks about is the statement complained of. Now, when all the masking drugs are put out of the words complained of, and that seems to make sense in their context, it's not as if the defense can say, well, you're having to complain about this bit, but we're going to defend that as covered. So what we're actually looking at, aren't we, for these purposes, is the words that are underlined. And whether there's one or more statements of opinion within that. As I understand it, they've got to be expressed statements of opinion, not implied statements of opinion. So you must be able to identify some words. Yes. When you say the words underlined, can I just clarify what you mean the words actually complained of in the particulars of claim? Well, I asked you earlier, I thought I'd got the answer, whether the words underlined in the judge's account of the words that he was looking at were the words complained of by the claimant. Out of six. Yeah. I think that's what you're asking about. Yes. I assume that. I'll quickly check the particulars of claim. I mean, he says that in seven. Firstly. No, actually, the underlined words aren't the words in the particulars of claim. That's page 88. Yes, pardon me, page 88. Yes. Is that, well, well, I was at a meeting ending in country. That's all underlined in page 88. And they were very, very abusive. That's underlined on page 88. I think it is. Oh, pardon. Yes, it's, sorry, it's, it's just included the bit I left out between the two. No, I think it's. He's done what pleaders often do. Yes. Which is to set out a lot of context. Yes. And identify the words complained of by underlining. Yes. So, on that basis, what I'm asking is whether the statute means that the material for consideration when assessing whether we're talking about fact or comment is the words complained of or as the phrase form isn't words, the statement complained of and no other material. That makes it sort of simpler than it seems to fit with the statutory wording. It also makes it binary. I mean, that's what I've been asking ever since we started this case this morning, really, is do you have to, can you only have one answer to the, to the section 3-2 question? It's, no, you can, you can definitely have a mixture of opinion and fact. Well, that's not an, that unfortunately doesn't help. Can you, the wording is, can you have, can the answer be part of the statement is fact, this part. Yes. And part of the statement is opinion, this part, because my Lord is putting to you and I was rather thinking that when you had a complaint and you, and what you've said in all your submissions about how you have to stand back and look at the whole thing and think about whether it's really fact or opinion. I thought what you were saying is no, you only get one answer. And if there's a, if there's a significant part of opinion, it'll be opinion. So, I mean, that's the sort of way I understood the case to be running, but you say no. It's, I have to admit a slight personal confusion about what we're up to. I think it's probably best to be honest. Can I put to you what I think the effect of this section may be on the facts of this case? See if we can, if I can express myself more clearly than I have. You look at the statement complained of, in this case, the words. And the question is, does that to any extent consist of a statement of opinion? It may in part be a statement of fact, and it may in part be a statement of opinion. If the answer is to no extent, does it consist of a statement of opinion, then clearly the defense can't run. But if in part it's a statement of opinion, then it 
is a defense to an action for defamation in respect of that part that it was a that it was a statement of opinion as long as all the other conditions are satisfied yes but it yes. but isn't but, but what's being missed in all this analysis is the fact that one's actually searching for the sting which is what we're talking about which is what's defamatory and you have to be careful about being over prescriptive about this because the words the statement complained of or consist of a lot of words which you need to make sense of the bit yes you know you can't if you can't say abusive and then ignore everything else for example it's got to be put into a sentence yes. which gives it meaning and context yes and i don't think that the statute was presuming to force you to pick the one word out which makes everything clearly opinion or clearly fact you've got to be sensible about this yes and that what's really being hunted for by everyone is the defamatory imputation yes uh, and uh, well, although we have to consider sing in that context uh, and um, make sure we don't decide things in the right order in the wrong order that's actually what's going on here because that's what the claimant is complaining about is what what it means yes it's it's there has to be an overview a big picture yeah. it's it's impression and context I, so I don't think, that's I don't where think the meaning is mr hudson is saying anything different no but are you then are, is everybody really saying uh, that there is any really one question here because uh, it's not meaningful to break it down in to salami slice to use my tab again it's not really meaningful to salami slice because what you're looking for is to help answer the ultimate question is the sting defamatory mm. and therefore you need to know first if the sting is an opinion to see if section 3 defense can apply to it so you 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 may look at all the other things that are facts but if <coughs> so, so if i mean uh, i think in this case the, the bits that are the sting are disruptive and abusive. Yes. And without those, nobody would, we wouldn't be here, as Mr. Hudson put it this morning. So it's really quite irrelevant to answer my question about sentences one to ten and what happens if, because here the only question is, is were the words disruptive and abusive um, opinions? Yes. And if they were, then um, then that's fine. Then they're, you go through to the next gateway, three, two, and if not, not. And um, and if not, then probably um, if the uh, the same the reason, for instance, taking the, the expression very, very strong, you've got to say, well, is that really go to the crux of this? And we, well, it's, we would it's say context. no. It's it's in context. I mean, it's very unlikely that it's defamatory to say. Mr. Millet was very strong, um, very unlikely, so by itself. So we're really talking about what my lady calls, and I think it's a helpful um, helpful denomination, the sting in yes. the allegation. So, so the question I asked you, maybe the answer was, very interesting question, but actually not very relevant to this case. And bearing in mind that um, th this cannot be disputed, that one has to have regard to the fact that the viewer is watching the whole thing yes. and will not be sitting there with somebody explaining or um, salami slicing or picking words out. It's the impression they will get from looking at the whole thing yes. that matters. It's the, especially I think one of the cases, the ordinary reasonable reader doesn't have a lawyer whispering into his or her ear yeah. telling them how to interpret different parts. No, and, and, and everything, everything we've been um, that is, what the action is designed to do, and the legal principles are designed to do, is to try and work out what defence is available here for this particular statement. Yes, and that, and that's where the sting, that's where the meaning is so important, because mm -hmm. um, that. That draws the sting. That that's what it's all about, and that's what defences will focus on. I love moving on from the words complained of themselves to the meaning, uh, which again is a, a single, not very long document, which you will find 
at the easy well the, the place I've got it is page 62 of the core bundle In paragraph 80 of his judgment. 80 of his judgment. Um, now, of course, it's, this statement is, cannot be questioned. As a matter of fact, it's been found. There's, there's no appeal against it. This is what the words mean. Therefore, the real question is, is it defamatory? Or put another, another way, does it pass the threshold of seriousness? Now, if one takes the second sentence... So you've moved on to defamatory now? Yes, pardon me, I'll move from, from, from opinion to, to looking at the, the only issue over the, the meaning itself. Is, is, it, is it defamatory or not? And does it pass the threshold of seriousness? And we say one cannot really argue that Mr Justice Saini was plainly wrong in, in concluding defamatory and has a tendency to cause... Um, There's a lot of negatives there, but you say he was right. Yes, yes. Uh, I've got him past the test in, in uh, Thornton. Uh, if one just looks... Uh, and this, this is a bit simpler, because the law is well established, that one establishes whether something is defamatory or not, actually just from the meaning itself. So it's just this paragraph we work from. And if one just looks at the, the second sentence, he behaved in so disruptive a way at the meeting that the police wish to remove him from the premises. Now we say that, of course that's defamatory. And this argument about, I have to say, hardly technical argument. It's strange, duty. because it's not even what Mr Corbyn said. Mr Corbyn said from the meeting. Yes. Yes, So, and if the police want to throw, if the police, and it's clearly implicit in this, the police are present at the meeting, Mr Millet is behaving in such a way that they want to throw him out of it. Mr. Corbyn is describing the way he's behaving as being disruptive um, and being extremely abusive and causing distress to Mr. Tessassian. But well, probably that's after the speech. But for what's going on during the speech, for the police, the guardians of order, guardians of public order, to want to throw someone out of a meeting because they're being disruptive is clearly suggesting highly reprehensible behaviour. And just turning to the last sentence, it's something that's not really been dealt with, uh, where Mr. S Mr. Justice Saini says, this conduct of the claim towards Mr. Sassian was based on what Mr. Sassian had said at these meetings and all the views he was expressing. So this disruption is aimed at someone because of what they're saying, because they're expressing their political views. And it's clearly implicit in this that they're disrupting that meet that person from putting forward those views, and it's so disruptive, the police have formed an opinion that they want to throw him out. Okay. And we say that is defamatory, and that it passes the threshold, and that Mr Justice Sane is perfectly entitled to reach the conclusions he did. I mean, it, it does mix up the meeting slightly, doesn't it? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you're not entitled to make your submission, because you are. Uh, you're absolutely right to say on this meaning, um, the first sentence, you know, the claimant attended a meeting and behaved so disruptively that the police wished to remove him from the premises. Um, and then, I suppose, I suppose he does distinguish, doesn't he? Because he says such was the nature of the abuse after the speech that yes. he was caused distress. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's a bad point. But they're. they're attacking him or abusing him, being very, very abusive to him after the speech because of what he said. And again, that's, that's interfering with someone trying to ex express their views. It, they both identified as having form for disruption in these meetings. Well, I mean, Mr. Well, Hudson said not. He says it's because it's clear, even from this um, meaning, that it's after, he's not interrupting his right to express his views. He says it's, it's obvious that he's just exercising his, namely Mr. Millet's right to express his views in return. Uh, well, my lord, the second sentence of the meaning says, he, 
that Mr. Miller has behaved in so disruptive a way at this meeting. So it's identifying behaviour at, meet at this meeting the police wish to remove him from the premises. Yeah, that's the first meeting. That's the first one, but that's enough. Right. The claimant has acted in a disruptive way at other meetings. Yeah, no, I see at, a few, at a further meeting, he was abusive. I think this is where, after his speech, but we so far so good. We've all, already got so disruptive at one meeting, the police wanted to throw him out. In fact, he's got form for being disruptive at other meetings. And then that's not enough. Mr. Millet is described as being someone who comes up, the word berates isn't used, but causes distress to Mr. Hastasian after a meeting. And the common denominator, and Mr. To Justice Saini emphasises this in his judgment as to why he found it defamatory, is that this is interfering, this is stopping someone in a democracy, namely Mr. Namely Mr. Hassassian, being able to express his viewpoint. Because that viewpoint, the expression of that viewpoint, is being disrupted. <clears throat> and this argument about Mr. Corbyn's freedom of speech is neither here nor there. That's not what this court has to do. This court has to decide whether this meaning is plainly wrong or not. Well, we don't have to decide that. We have to decide whether, if, the, whether the judge was right to find that it was plainly defamatory. Plainly defamatory, pardon me. Pardon me. Um, unless I... I, I, I been rather short, but actually, I, I do think with these meaning applications, or not meaning whether it's opinion, whether it's defamatory, the points are straightforward. A labouring endless points of law is just a distraction from what a reasonable person would think. And Mr. Justice saying his judgment speaks for itself. He's interpreted a couple of hundred words in a straight, straightforward way as constituting statements of fact, concluded the statements of defamatory, and we rely on his reasoning as well as the arguments put forward in our skeleton and in oral submissions. Uh, unless I could be of further well, assistance on a particular to point. The word, the, the criminality. Well, mm. it's, if the police... Criminality wasn't pleaded as a meaning by the claimant, and criminality isn't a word you'll find in the meaning found by Mr Justice Saini. But what you will find in the meaning as found by Mr. Justice Saini, is that police wish to remove Mr. Millet from the premises. Now, even without, with or without criminality, we say that that's highly defamatory. But clearly, it's suggesting that there is some sort of criminal behavior. And one must bear in mind, this is not from the perspective of a judge or a lawyer. This is from the perspective of the reasonable person watching the program. The police enforce the criminal law. The police prevent crimes being committed. Uh, public order offences, or just the fact that the police will be known to the reasonable reader to prevent, set up to prevent public order offences, which are criminal matters, feeds into this meaning, uh, feeds into whether this is defamatory or not. I mean, say Mr Justice said he was entitled to say but actually, the reference to the police does bring in a suggestion of criminal behaviour, whether spelled out in the meaning or not. <coughs> and I mean, even it's if not... It's interesting that in the meaning, he says, wish to remove him from the premises. And Mr Corbyn said something that could arguably be described as worse, namely, throw him out. But anyway, yes. may not matter. Yes, throw, throw him out clearly, again, is, uh, carries with it uh, the implication that whether, strictly speaking, criminal or not, it, it's, it's highly disruptive behaviour. Well, I'm not sure the police can throw people out unless they do apprehend some, um, as my lady said, and she'll be the expert, not the public order offence. Yes. But the reasonable reader, reasonable viewer is just think, well, this... This isn't just just heckling or something. This is disrupting. This puts very, very, very abusive. No, I mean the way I would look at it puts is everything if, if it were just heckling or something, it might be invited him to leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which so, is different. so 
clearly criminality isn't mentioned in the meaning, but that doesn't prevent Mr Justice Saini concluding as why it's defamatory and why it reaches the threshold. But actually there is, there is a hint of criminality there. And at least acting contrary to the rules enforced by the police. I mean, what do you say about the point I put to Mr Hudson? I'm sorry to keep you on your feet. That's quite all right. Plainly don't want to be on them, Mr. And it, but what do you say about the point I put to, to, to Mr Hudson about the political circumstances that this is all, you know, basically part of the rough and tumble of political life? Mr Corbyn was defending himself against some very strong allegations and those that agreed with him would probably... Um, you know, that it's just the question of, of whether it's defamatory or not it depends on which standpoint you take. If you agree with Mr Millett, you think one thing, and if you agree with Mr Corbyn, you think another. And um, this is sort of um, not really the stuff of defamation. I didn't well, put it like that to Mr Hudson, but I think you understand. It's the turning point in this programme, we admit it's a programme about current affairs. It's a programme that, in which Mr. Moore introduces the topic of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Yeah, but I mean, then, I get all that, but I mean, but it, takes, you know, it was a very, un I mean, on any basis, this is a memorable television programme. Yes. You know, it was a, a memorable interview. You know, it, it, you don't get interviews like this every day, even on the Mar programme. No. So, um, it obviously was very high, high octane, if I can put it that way, and there, there are going to be two very strongly held views. But we question the use of the word view, because there's a turning point in the programme where the recording is played and Mr Corbyn says two people, which happen to include the claimant, they clearly have two problems. One is they don't want to study history, and secondly, having lived in this country for a long time and probably all their lives, they don't understand the English irony either. Yeah, but now, that's not that the point, allegation of defamation. At that point, if Mr Corbyn had responded, apologised and said, well, that's not what I meant when I was talking about English irony. When I said Zionists, I didn't, I didn't mean Jewish people. He could have stayed within that political debate. What he did was do a, a right and about turn and he attacked the two people he, he said didn't understand English irony. It's at that point that this goes, you might say it's in the context of a political argument, but it's at that point that Mr Corbyn decides to make an ad hominem attack. And it's that point at which any cloak of protection he might have for a political speech falls away from him or is cast aside by Mr Corbyn because he is making what we say a factual allegation about police wanting to throw Mr Millard out of a meeting, disruptive at several meetings. That's not a proper way to conduct politics. And if a, a politician or any member of the public starts to make factual allegations like that, then they should be... It should be and possible I suppose you say if it's true, he'll, he, he won't be liable. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I've, I've, sorry, I, I'm sorry to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Hudson. Uh, my lords, my lady, I will, um, if I may, make some brief points in reply. Um, <clears throat> could, I, could I start with, I'm afraid I've got nine points, but they're brief. Are you allowed to have nine points, Mr. Hudson? <laughs> I was hoping to get to ten, but it's doesn't quite work. Um, my learned friend suggested that it, it was uh, our case that the 2013 Act had abolished the bare opinion rule, and I, and I submit it is a rule. Um, th that isn't our submission. Um, my submission was that to the extent that the bare opinion rule has survived the 2013, it has, it has found statutory enactment in section 
My learned friend was asked by my Lord Lord Justice Warby, this is my second point, whether or not the bare comment principle or point was a, a rule of law or something else. Um, uh, and my lady, the president, uh, suggested it, it might be a hint or, or, or a tip as to how one interprets um, the statement complained of. I think I was saying what was the tenet. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry about that, yes. My lady was picking up on the, the point my lady from Mr. Bennett is making. My lord, my lady, it, it seems to us, having looked at Spiller, although it, it, it is to an extent unclear, it seems to us that it is in fact treated or regarded uh, as, a, as a principle of law uh, as to the way in which the courts are to treat statements which are otherwise opinion, but because they do not provide a sufficient indication of the facts which form the basis of that opinion, they are nonetheless to be treated as statements of fact. So it, it is not, we submit, a, a, a as my learned friend would suggest, a hint or a tip as to interpretation or guidance as to interpretation. It is in fact a clear rule of law that such Statements which are otherwise to be, would be regarded by a viewer or reader as opinion are to be treated in law as a matter of fact. And we say that is very clear from the analysis of the Supreme Court in Spiller, particularly at paragraphs 88 onwards. Uh, and there is, I, I won't take the court to it now, but do invite the court to look at it because it is clear that the court deals at that point with how, how the law is to treat such, such statements of opinion and why the rationale behind this principle of law that such statements of opinion are to be treated as statements of fact. And linked to that, the point my Lord Lord Justice will be put to me about Mr. N Mr. Justice Nicklin's judgment in Kutsegianus at paragraph 16, subparagraph 4, it is clear from that 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 was the approach Mr Justice Nicklin was taking because he's, he uses the word treated. So he, he is, Mr Justice Nicklin was recognising that it is a matter of law, we submit, that that's how certain opinions or statements of opinion are treated. And, and as I've already made the submission, that's what has now been enacted into section. That principle has been enacted into section three three, and as I've already said, that is made absolutely clear from the legislative history of section three, which we've set out in detail in the skeleton argument. My learned friend hasn't addressed at all, and we also, with respect, entirely agree with my lord, the master of the rolls's point that if bare opinion still features can feature in the issue under section 3.2, 3.3 would not be needed. And, and we suggest my learned friend, Mr. Bennett, simply had no uh, real answer to that point, because there is no answer to that point. Section 3.3 would be unnecessary. But it's, it's clear, absolutely clear from the legislative history, that's what Parliament was doing. Um, my learned friend, this is my third point. My learned friend relies on the, uh, a similar principle applies in contract. We say that that really doesn't assist this court at all. Um, it, it's in no way analogous or helpful. Um, fourth point, my learned friend says the single meaning rule applies to, as I understand it, that applies to the question under section 3.2. We don't accept that. I don't propose, I, I, we don't consider it necessary to argue it on this appeal we, because we simply submit to the court that the wording of section 3.2 is absolutely plain. If this court considers the matter afresh, it is for the court to consider whether the statement complained of uh, is a statement of opinion or, or, or not. Um, well, I, think you're, I think I know what this case is. I mean, it's the words, the evaluative words that we've got in the meaning of Judge Pounds. I think it's not proved any different. No, my lord, I, I don't. That's one. Of, and abusive. Yes, that, that's one of the reasons I don't propose to argue it in yeah. this court. 
uh, and there is there is authority um, there's authority either way on this issue and it's only right that I uh, I refer my lord uh, and my lady to um, in, in the most recent edition of, of Duncan and Neil it's addressed at paragraph 30 and 11 pages 140 141 I'm afraid it's not in the bundle but we will provide the court with copies um, and, and th that's on section 3.2 and at the end of paragraph 13 11 it says it follows that the single meaning rule is likely to continue to apply to a defence of honest opinion as it does for example to a defence of truth and, and cites a decision of low, low and associated newspapers and late against the evening standard if necessary and I don't suggest it is necessary at this hearing we, would, we take issue with on the basis of the decisions of the Privy Council and Bonnet and Morris. Sorry, you take issue with what? The, the, the proposition that the single meaning rule applies to the defence of honest opinion and critically, and, well, critically to the question under Section 3.2, whether or not the statement of complained of is a statement of opinion. But You're saying it doesn't? We say it does. We would submit, if we had to, we'd submit it doesn't apply. But we, I, I deliberately haven't sought to develop that argument. Yeah, well, you've got some difficulty with that because that was the point I argued in the other council first. And I think it's probably because no trans the other way anyway. It's a, it's a novel point of this. No, well, Lord, yes. <laughs> and it may be <laughs> if, I, if it becomes. Well, my lady argued when done successfully on the previous occasion. If it becomes a live issue, it may be I'd have to argue it in another court. But yeah. uh, as, but as, as I was saying, I don't think it matters at all no. in this case because the words are there. And they're in the meaning. The, the, oh. the, the expressions of opinion, and I do accept for the purposes of an honest opinion defence under Section 3, one would have to, identi one has to identify the opinion. And I agree with my learned friend on this. Those parts of the defence which refer to the opinion, one has to identify what the opinion was. But in this case, we say, it's, as my Lord Lord Justice Warby says, it's clear what the opinion was. It was the opinion that Mr Millett had been really, really strong and very, very abusive and the other the other points we have made. So to that extent it's clear. Um, the uh, sixth point fifth, fifth point <laughs> I'm glad someone's keeping count. <laughs> Um, it's simply the, the question of what, what if some, some is opinion and some is fact. Uh, and and we, we agree that under Section 3.2, the court has to determine whether the statement complained of is opinion, but can, in reaching that decision, make, make, reach the conclusion that parts of it are fact and parts of it are statement of opinion. And the court would, as that, as part of that process, identify which parts are fact and which parts are opinion. But effectively, you would accept what my lady says that what matters here, anyway, is whether the sting is fact or opinion. My lord, if and to the extent the sting means the imputation, then I don't accept that. No. And the reason I don't accept that is because, with the greatest respect, is because the word imputation does not feature in section three. Um, as the court will be aware, the um, imputation is um, in, is the word imputation is used in section two under the truth defense. It is not used in section three, the honest opinion defense, nor is it used in section four, the public interest defense. Uh, and so we, we do submit that Parliament has clearly sought to draw a distinction, and we say for understandable reasons, that when considering a, a truth defence, the court has to consider the imputation, i.e. the sting, and it's that imputation or sting which is conveyed which a defendant has to prove is substantially true. That does not apply, we submit, where it comes to honest opinion and public interest. Uh, and my, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby, I know, has considered this issue in, in relation to Section 4. Um, uh, and, and 
we say it's a, it's a quite different issue. And so uh, when looking at Section 3.2, if this court was, were to consider the matter afresh, one does not test it or determine it by the, uh, in the light of the meaning found by Mr. Justice Saini. The, the court would, we say, look at the statement complained of, and we say one, one actually looks at the entirety of the 24-minute programme, or, or the 24-minute segment of the programme, and the, the, the parts of that that are complained of, and then in the light of that, in accordance with Section 3.2, the court then has to decide whether all or any of that, those words complained of, in that context are a statement of opinion, and if so, identify, it would be necessary to identify what the opinion is for the purposes of the rest of the discovery. I don't think that's very different to what I said, because um, if disruptive and abusive was a statement of opinion, uh, that's enough for you, and yes. if not, it's not. Uh, yes, in, in this case, it may it may not actually matter. No, I understand because the the imputation or the sting may be, and, and, and in reality, it's my submission that it is. It's the same as the opinion. Mm. Okay, so it may not matter. But strictly, we say, as a matter of statutory construction, that is the correct approach. Um, six, six. I thought I heard my learned friend say that it was common, gra common ground that the court only needed to look at a slice of the programme. It's not that is not common ground, uh, as as I said at the outset. We we submit that it's appropriate to look at the full twenty four minutes because uh, because that that is what the reasonable view, viewer would most likely do, and I th as I thought that early on in the hearing, my Lord Lord Justice will be agreed. Or it indicated that it was assumed that that's what a, a reasonable viewer would do. They would watch. But, and it's, but, it's but obvious. What, that but what issue do you say it goes to? I'm just trying to pin you down on. Oh, my lady, how it factors I, into the issues we're considering here. Yes, I'm. I'm grateful. Um, it goes to both the issue of opinion versus fact, and defamatory tendency. And, and also, it's very likely that if someone was watching the Andrew Marr programme or that part of it, they would watch the full interview. They certainly wouldn't just watch the bits that are complained of. Well, really? <laughs> well, it, it'd, be, it'd be artificial, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. If the judges got to put themselves, for the purposes of meaning, this is, a, this is standard practice, you've yeah. got to look at the whole thing. Uh, it would be bizarre if the judge had to then ignore some part of what he or she has already read yes. when considering whether what they've read or viewed the bit in its context yes. is fact or comment. Um, but, but I think my lady's question is really why does it matter in this case because the rest of it's all about the stuff. Well, it, 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 it only matters because <clears throat> it, it could potentially have an impact on whether a viewer regarded it as, as opinion or fact the reasons I've tried to uh, explain, and also whether the reasonable viewer regarded as defamatory tendency. Um, but the, the only reason I raise it because I was surprised when my learned friend said it was agreed, it was common ground that the court only had to look at a slice of the program. And if, if by a slice of the program he means something other than the 24 minute interview, that isn't, that isn't common ground. Um, point seven was, was the point that. My Lord, the Master of the Rolls just asked me about sting and imputation uh, and, and Section 3.2. So I've dealt with that. And then point eight, it, it was simply to respond to my learned friend's submissions about the, the effect of Mr. Justice Saini's meaning. Uh, um, and we do submit, my learned friend, Clearly, it, it, it is confusing the different meetings and the different allegations about each meeting. And it, it is not right for him 
to suggest, as he, as I understood him to do, that in some way the allegation of disruption was related to the allegation that of Mr. Hassassian's speech. It is not. They are two quite separate um, allegations. The disruption what? relates to. I'm sorry, my name. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't think he suggested that. I think uh, the disruption okay. was earlier. And uh, I, well, it, it, this one was when he came, they came up to him afterwards. And then, then I don't need to say anything. And, and it's not in the meaning when you read the meaning. No. So I don't think you need to address that. Although okay. it is perhaps to, to comment. That uh, the reasonable viewer might find it very hard to distinguish between all the uh, parts of the story. Yes. Yes, and and, and my lord, I, I, I of course recognise that and accept that, uh, uh, but that takes us back to the the point my lord put to me earlier about how a reasonable viewer would really see this all, all of a piece. And then the, the, the last point is uh, simply about uh, removing from the premises, which is the, um, the, the meaning which Mr. Justice Sane found. Uh, and again, I repeat, I think the point I said earlier, it, it is important to remember that that was a meeting in the House of Commons. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we would say, reasonable viewer would appreciate that that was a private meeting in the House of Commons uh, and that to say that because someone's being disruptive during a meeting in, in the House of Commons that the police wanted to remove them from the premises does not hint at criminality because it could be for all sorts of reasons and even if it's a, a low level of disruption uh, that, that could result in police officers wanting to remove, but always one has to come back to the next part of that meeting, which is Mr. Corbyn, however, asked the claimants, the claimant to be allowed to remain, which undoubtedly we submit would, to the reasonable view, temper um, whatever they thought about uh, Mr. Millett following the allegation about the, um, the suggestion that the police wanted to remove them from the premises because of some, uh, of some disruption. My lords, my lady, those are the only submissions I wanted to make in reply. Is there anything else I can assist the court with? No. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Hatton. Great. Uh, we will um, <clears throat> take time to consider our judgments. Uh, when we hand them down, we'll first send them to the parties for head textual only corrections. And please agree an order as a result of the judgments and costs, and if you can't, those matters will be dealt with in writing. Thank you both, uh, and thank you to your solicitors for the helpful arguments. All right.